Open the gate. We just want to go in by food and stuff. What is this place? Guantanamo? Omer, Walid, and 700 others wait behind the razor wire encircling the detention center on the island of Samos. They have no information at all on what's to happen to them, and they feel they're being treated like criminals. Why are we locked up in here? Is this Europe? What about human rights? Why are they detaining us here when they let others through? Between last October and the 19th of March, MSF teams offered assistance to refugees landing on beaches. As soon as the migrants obtained their documents, they would board the ferry to Athens and continue their journey to Europe. But now that the registration centers on islands in the Aegean Sea have been turned into detention centers from where people are deported back to Turkey, MSF and numerous volunteers and aid organizations have decided to withdraw their assistance. The decision to suspend our work in Samos was really tough, a really big decision. We are aware that what MSF is doing on the island isn't enough, but we refuse to do more because we don't want to have anything to do with sending migrants back to Turkey. These Syrians consider themselves lucky as they arrived just before March the 20th. They've been given the documents allowing them to continue their journey, but to where? When they disembark in Athens, they will end up among the 5,000 people already camping in squalor at the port. The food is really bad. The water too. It's toilet water, not drinking water. And people keep getting sick because of it. We're treated like animals here with this food they give us. The Greek authorities are trying to transfer the migrants to camps, but most of them, uncertain of the reception they'll get or fearful of being deported, are refusing to board the buses. Mid-March, the authorities managed to get around 1,500 people to move to a camp not far from the Albanian border. Two weeks on, these families, some with very young babies, are living in tents pitched on stony ground while temperatures drop close to zero at night. The situation here is not good, but we have no other choice. We will have to stay till we get some help and to reach our relatives. There is nowhere for us to go. We've been homeless for too long. We've had enough frustration and humiliation. We fled Daesh. The situation is even worse in Idomini, where several thousand people wait in front of the razor wire fence but the Macedonian border remains firmly closed. 60% of the people that are stuck today in Greece are women and children, and more than 90% of these people have a clear uh, refugee status. They really come from war-torn places. Um, this is a, a failure of Greece, but a failure of Europe to collectively, to collectively respond to a problem. What we call the refugee crisis, uh, we want to object to that, I want to object to that. Uh, the problem is that we have failed uh, to receive them. The problem is that we wanted to make their lives as, as difficult as possible. Over 50,000 refugees are trapped in Greece. Their only alternative, at least for the time being, is to apply for asylum. But they're well aware that it's impossible for the country to process all the applications and adequately accommodate everyone. Cholera broke out around Lake Chilwa at the end of December. Within just a few months, over 900 people have contracted the disease and 25 have died. Worst affected are the 6,000 fishermen living in floating houses in the middle of this huge expanse of water. This boat is ferrying a vaccination team. It takes hours to get to the different groups of fishermen. They are living in risky area. They don't have toilets. They use the same water as their toilets and they also use the same water as their source of water, drinking water. Most of the patients that are treated uh, in the health facilities along the beaches, most of them they are coming from the fishing camps. MSF decided to adopt a new strategy adapted to these fishermen who move around constantly. 
They're administered the first dose of vaccine when it's distributed, and two weeks later they give themselves the second dose. People living on the lake's shores are also susceptible to the disease, so they've been given the vaccine as well. The teams have now immunized a total of 80,000 people. Along with the vaccine, MSF distributes individual water filters so that the fishermen have access to clean water, which protects them against cholera. This is the emergency room in Médecins Sans Frontières Hospital in Aden. Last July, the city was the scene of heavy fighting between the Houthis and the Saudi-led coalition, and the hospital was just a few hundred meters from the front line. In spite of the signing of a truce mid-April, the situation is still extremely tense, and many people injured during sporadic fighting or by landmines continue to arrive at the hospital. Some of the city's hospitals have reopened, but obtaining supplies remains a real challenge. The airport is still shut and the only way MSF can get drugs is to ship them in from Djibouti. In recent years, the world has been described as an increasingly hostile place for humanitarian aid workers. Kidnappings, violence, assassinations, the risks appear to be constantly rising. Using a variety of methodologies, several studies on different periods have attempted to quantify the phenomenon. All these studies arrive at the same conclusion. Deliberate attacks against aid workers are increasing. However, several biases distort these conclusions, particularly the use of absolute data. According to the Aid Worker Security Database, the number of aid workers killed, injured or kidnapped increased fourfold between 1997 and 2013. But in proportion to the total number of aid personnel, victim numbers remain stable for the same period, fluctuating between 40 and 60 per 10,000 between 1997 and 2013. So aid workers are exposed to no more danger than before. Certain regions have always been more dangerous than others. For example, the Great Lakes region and the Horn of Africa between 1985 and 1998. Nowadays, it's Somalia, Afghanistan, Syria, and both Sudans. But even in these countries, sweeping generalizations are problematic, as annual homicide rates vary from 9 per 100,000 in Sudan and Afghanistan to 58 per 100,000 in Somalia. To conclude that there is intent, in these areas at least, to target humanitarian aid requires comparing violence committed against aid workers with that committed against the civilian population in general. To date, nothing proves that aid workers are the targets of generalized or specific violence, or that violence has increased. However, it is clear that the number of aid workers exposed to danger is growing. During the Cold War, delivery of humanitarian aid was usually confined to the fringes of hostilities, refugee camps for example, whereas now it is increasingly delivered right at the heart of conflict. And those delivering it are far greater in number. For example, the number of Médecins Sans Frontières staff has increased threefold since 1998. In Syria, MSF is providing support to 70 medical facilities, so inevitably the risk of becoming a target has increased accordingly. In practice, without qualitative analysis, this plethora of numbers serves to justify the calling in of experts and implementation of more and more procedures. The profusion of guides, protocols and rules puts the focus on protecting institutions rather than aid workers. Security regulations are no longer based on experience garnered in the field, but rather on a management approach designed to protect employers from legal redress. With employment contracts growing from one to a dozen pages in just a few years, MSF has not been immune to the trend. 
This victimization of aid workers serves a second purpose. It transforms them into martyrs whose protection takes priority over that of the very civilian populations they are supposed to be helping. Tous les migrants à peu près, ils ont quitté leur pays à cause de la guerre. Et moi personnellement, même si je suis arrivé avec un visa et je n'ai pas, pas fait le parcours, j'ai vécu la même situation, c'était très facile de les comprendre, de, de comprendre pourquoi ils sont tristes, pourquoi ils sont fâchés, pourquoi ils sont venus ici. Ça a aidé beaucoup les migrants d'avoir confiance en nous, à MSF. Ce n'est pas seulement les gens qui viennent pour euh, la consultation, c'était des gens qui cherchaient d'être rassurés. Et euh, c'était notre rôle de, au début comme traducteur. Même par exemple, moi je parle arabe, je ne parle pas farsi ou je ne parle pas bachtou. Mais c'était très important d'utiliser d'autres euh, langages comme d'être toujours souriant, serrer la main, taper sur l'épaule s'il est fatigué, de transmettre le message sans parler. Je vois des jeunes comme ça qui, normalement, euh, qui devaient être à l'école, au lycée, à l'université, qu'ils ont tout perdu dans leur pays. Ils cherchent l'espoir, ils cherchent leur famille ou leurs frères qui sont en Angleterre, ils cherchent la sécurité. Et c'est très important pour nous, à MCF à Calais, de leur dire qu'on est là. Si vous êtes malade, si vous avez besoin de parler, si vous avez même besoin d'être au chaud, il y a pas mal de gens qui venaient chez nous, ce n'est pas parce qu'ils étaient malades, mais on, on le comprend. Il est là vraiment parce qu'il cherchait quelque chose. Et, il a... Et je suis très très content qu'il le trouvait chez nous. Je ne crois pas que je vais oublier ça. Je ne vais jamais oublier qu'il y a des gens qui, qui souffrent vraiment. Ce soir, je vais rentrer chez ma famille. Je serai chez moi. Je, je vais prendre ma douche. Je serai dans mon lit. Avant, c'était normal. Mais maintenant, c'est complètement différent.